I am thrilled to have these three amazing leaders who um, I think takes courage to be here, to be talking about what we're going to be talking about, how you respond in a crisis, and how you manage through that and lead through that. We're talking about leadership, and that's what this today is about. Um, Eric Sullenberg is the global CEO of CPNB. We're thrilled to have him here. He's a fellow Viking. Hey, in Norway? Sweden, but oh well. So if you don't understand me, it's because I'm not native English, <laughs> so you have to excuse me. Um, John Seifert is uh, the head of uh, Ogilvy. You may know him. Thank you, John. And Krista Cavallo is the CEO of the Martin Agency. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, so I had this big starting question. God, poor Wade embarrassed me. Women always ask the why. So I was going to ask the why, but I thought, you know what? We're going to go to the how, right straight to the how, because we've got to manage time. Um, we have had uh, an incredible year in our industry. It has been uh, filled with so much, well, in our world, but um, so much change. And each of you have been in environments where you came into your leadership. Uh, um, Chris and yours is a little different, but you two were, you arrived into leadership, and very shortly after you were putting into place some great things, you were hit. So let's first talk about that experience of you came into your agency and you had visions of what you wanted to do. Could you talk about what you wanted to do and then when you were faced with a crisis, what you did do? So maybe, Eric, would you start with that experience, like landing from Sweden and, uh, and uh, what your vision was and what kind of the global impact, the differences in, in the world? Well, I come from a very different society, just with a different different context. Uh, a society that is based upon the the idea of equality of opportunity. Uh, a, a society that is way much more collective in its thought. Believe it or not, but we have things like free healthcare, free education through university. I just listened to the speaker before me, uh, and we have 12-month maternity leave by, by law. 12 months, people. I would say that most of my male creatives at Forceman was at home for at least six months when they had a kid. So I come from a very different context, and, and it just gives people, if you're brought up in a society like that, you have a way much more of a collective thinking that creates a lot more trust around the system that you're a part of, and that also affects your relationship to your working place. Um, I knew that it wasn't like this in the US, but I still have some core beliefs around that, and I'm in, the, in sort of the, the, the phase that the whole industry is undergoing and the need of change, I, maybe this is a little brave of me to say, but I actually think that my experience can bring something to an agency in the US, and, uh, I'm not going to be naive around it. I can't change the mindset of people in this country. And I really appreciate the fact that you are so much driven. Uh, but maybe I can balance it a little bit and, and enforce the idea of radical collaboration where I think the future lies for this industry and just figuring out a different type of organization. So I had, I had some really high ambitions, definitely. I still have. That's awesome. I want to hear more about that. John, you have been... Um, when we talked, I love it. I said, you've been there for 30 years. So you're like, yeah, give or take a decade um, <laughs> at Ogilvy. Uh, you came up the ranks. You took on the role of CEO. And you had a very clear idea about turning the Titanic, if you will. Can you talk about the whole refounding and what that meant to you and how that's kind of playing itself out? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I have the privilege of leading the only company I've ever worked in. So. Um, I'm the ninth chief executive of Ogilvy. I'll be the last one who was mentored by all the previous eight, including David Ogilvy himself. So my, my vision or my ambition was pretty simple. I wanted to bring the company back to the core of what the founder was all about. And you know, we live in a time when every, everything is dead, everything is changing, nothing's the same. And yet, you know, David Ogilvy had a view of building brands back in 1948 that put the power of creativity and ideas, and at that time, advertising. Uh, which had a disproportionate contribution to brand building. So I wanted to go back, not to celebrate the founder, but to help employees rediscover the founder so that the core beliefs, the core values, the reason we matter could be applied in one of the most dynamic, changing, disruptive um, moments in, in the history of our industry. 
And you know, I, I get up every day worried about just one thing. This, is the, this company has given me almost everything I treasure in life. I want to make sure that the next 70 years pay that back to a, a whole bunch of other people like me. Oh, I love that. So um, Kristen, you, you came in after the fact. These guys came in before the fact, and we'll talk about the fact. Um, you came in after the fact, and when we spoke, you said the most beautiful thing, which was, I was, what was it, the, an unexpected CEO. Um, could you talk a little about being that unexpected CEO and then landing and how, what your vision is in that situation? Sure. Um, I am the first female CEO in um, my company's 53-year history. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, though um, I, I got the job because I'm a woman. I got the job because I was a way to change a narrative and I was a PR move. Um, that doesn't mean I'm not the most qualified person for the job or the right person for the job. It's just an acknowledgement that that's why I got the job. I had never interviewed to be a CEO before becoming one um, and I had 21 hours of prep time. I was sitting at my job at Mullen Lowe on a Monday. I got a call at Tuesday, uh, at 2 p.m. rather, and on Tuesday uh, at 11.30, I was um, the CEO of the Martin Agency, or being introduced as the CEO of the Martin Agency. So uh, I didn't have a plan. I was probably 90 days in before I had a 30-day plan. Um, <laughs> I was scared to death. Um, uh, I'm still kind of scared. I, you can probably see my heart pounding through my dress. Um, I, I, um, I was unexpected because I did not um, throw my hat in the ring. But, um, it, it, and I don't mean this to sound callous when I say it, but it has been the greatest gift of my career to be the CEO at this time, coming in to help a group of people reconcile and trust after a moment like that. So um, I feel enormously lucky. So, um, Things are going along swimmingly. Well, you, you're not yet, <laughs> um, but but for you two, uh, Eric and, and John, things are going along swimmingly. You're really seeing change. I know we spoke, both of you, had sort of feeling like your visions and you, and you were implementing and things that you felt like there was impact, and then you get the phone call that something's happened or there's an awareness that, um, and we'll just you know call it the Me Too moment at your agency, and. Talk about that moment. Talk about what you did. Um, I'd love to start with you, John, because one of the things I think you modeled so brilliantly, or both of you did, was true transparency around this. So let's talk. Be, uh, tell us the story. Well, I, I mean, I think you know there are moments that get headlines uh, with your clients, with the industry, with uh, you know, with people who matter. You know, the fact is is that things go on every single day in our companies that need to be dealt with. Um, and I think the time that we're living in now points to a reality, which is that in the past, if there were ways of making excuses or looking the other way or thinking, well, that was just an isolated incident, it's not a pattern, or you know, there wasn't really, they didn't really mean it or whatever, that there were ways of looking past it. And I think we live in a time now where that's sort of over. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we talk about this at length as brand building you know, companies. Authenticity is essential. Values and beliefs are what sustain brands over time. And, and to be honest, the, the only thing that I'm trying to do as an, as an agent of change with many, many others in our company is to say, we will not be trusted, we will not be a brand for the future if we don't hold each other accountable. And, and now we have more mechanisms than ever to hold people accountable. I mean, I had the benefit of, I work with an amazing woman in the audience, Donna Pedro, and oh, we started working together when I was leading our North America business and we put in place programs and mechanisms that would make our priorities and our principles visible to all and actually make you at least once a year say, in writing with your signature, you believe in this and you're going to follow it. And when you ask everyone to do that and you have examples of where it doesn't happen and you choose to look the other way, well, I, I think now in the age we live in, you do that at your peril. Because then why should anyone trust you on big things or small things? So 
all we're trying to do now, and we've had a couple of very visible examples of it, but the truth is we're doing it every day. We are just saying it is not acceptable to commit to one thing and behave in another way, and if it violates the core principles and values and beliefs of the firm, you will be fired. It's really that simple. Zero tolerance. Yeah. Well, I don't even think of it, I, I mean, I, I, I don't even, I hate that language, because one of the things that's hard when you make difficult choices or you make choices is you, you say these things are black and white. There is always a ton of complexity in the detail of these things. So I think you, all you say is you try and get people confidence to say, we believe things, we hold people accountable, we, we, we evaluate their, their behavior in as an objective and fair way as possible, and if we conclude that you know, this, what they have done violates that, then there are consequences. Yeah. And Eric, how about for you? What was that experience and the work that you've done since then? It's been amazing. I think I'm willing to say zero tolerance. I, I have a very core principle, and that is that everyone works, who works at the agency are important, and therefore they have the right to be treated with respect. It doesn't matter who you are within the organization. Everyone is, is important for what we do. It goes for every single individual. And, and not uh, working at the agency and not accepting that as a fact, that everyone has the right to be treated with respect is it's just not accepted. It's a core principle. I, uh, to me, it's super important. Um, when we have the incident, of course, you have to take some immediate action. You have to be quick, and you have to make decisions uh, quickly. But I think transparency and 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 just have the courage and uh, just accept the fact that you're responsible for this um, is is super important. And and luckily, I come from a country that has a lot of sort of has a different relationship to this. Sweden is, is number five in the world when it comes to gender gap. This country is number 49. So we have sort of implemented that by laws. So I just decided to implement Swedish standard at the agency. So I immediately appointed a, an equality group made up of employees that are fully responsible to put the pressure on leadership when it comes to the equality question. I gave them a budget to do a survey uh, within the agency, totally unbiased from, from leadership. Leadership has no participation in this at all because I want the, the people who work at the agency to put pressure on me when it comes to redefining our policies and our action plans. Uh, so we've done all of that. And I made that decision the first day I heard of this. I just called the whole agency together and made a decision. This is the way we're going to do it, and we're going to do it now. And that has been going on since then. And I think it is... You have to be brave, but you also have to follow your heart as a leader. You have to be, com you sort of have to go back to yourself and think about what do I believe in and then stay true to that. So you have to be a little bit fearless in relationship to your job and what you do, but follow your conviction. And uh, luckily, I, because I've been doing this my whole professional life when I was the CEO of Forceman and Boot and Force, we had a yearly survey. We had an equality group at the agency. We had yearly updated policies and action plans, how to drive this. Uh, so luckily I had some tools. Now Kristen, you, what happened at your 90 day, 30 day <laughs> <laughs> experience? Because you put some very specific things. You basically blew it up. We blew it up. Yeah, so talk yeah, about the blow um, Because, uh, I will tell you, I think we all signed those things before. I sign them every year. Um, and I think we had uh, HR groups, and I think we had um, you know, people that stood up and said, do good things and treat each other well, and, um, and shit still happened. So it wasn't enough. Um, I, uh, oh my god, we've done so much in 10 months. Like Literally, we have a list. It's like 76 things, which I can't use the 31 minutes to do that. But. Um, we, I appointed a female chief creative officer. She's the first in our agency's 53 year history. Here's the amazing thing. Like I had um, an embarrassment of riches when it came to creative directors that I could have chosen from in that company. Um, Martin tends to have a very low turnover rate. We had some incredibly talented people who'd done some of the most iconic work. And every single man who was credible and capable for the job told me to hire this woman, Karen Costello who amazingly I met in 2014 sitting on a stage at the 3% conference. And I'd never seen her before and never seen her after. But I knew we thought the same things were important. And that was hugely important to me because I was not going to argue um, with somebody about what was important. 
And um, we can argue about a lot of things, but we, we had to agree on the main, main, main important things. So within two weeks, we eliminated the wage gap. We, um, Excuse me. You eliminated the wage we gap. We eliminated the wage gap. Thanks, Sally Crotchet. We, we looked at our salaries. We got an outside firm to look at our salaries, and we made the corrections, and it felt like Christmas. And then we're like, oh my god, what can we do? So then we signed free the bid. So then we tripled our paternity leave. So then we doubled the number of women on EC. We doubled the number of, uh, of, of minorities on EC. We, um, we did unconscious bias training. And then we realized, as I'm watching Starbucks, that that's irrelevant. Um, because it's not irrelevant, it's smart, but it's not enough. It's not enough to take a half a day because harassment isn't the issue. Harassment is a result. The issue is we had failed to communicate. We did not know how to productively disagree and we did not know how to constructively critique. And so harassment was, an, was a, a result of the fact that it was not a safe place to tell the truth. And we had to learn how to make it a safe place to tell the truth. So we got really tactical and we gave every manager $5 gift cards to go get coffee with every single person they report to. And we created uncomfortable conversations, which is an idea that we totally stole from our friends at Campbell Ewald, because I called them in on first week on the job and said, you guys live through something hard, come help me. And they dropped everything. And I'll tell you, within 24 hours, showed up on our door and spoke to our whole staff. And we would do the same thing for you as I'm sure they would. Um, we have just, like, we have blown up everything. We blew up HR. We burned bridges just so we wouldn't go back over them, because all the research said that most people after crisis revert back to pre-crisis behavior. Um, and we knew that that was not going to happen. And so we have, um, the greatest thing about being in a crisis situation is that the day I got to the agency, I thought I was going to see fragility. I thought I was going to see um, pieces of people. Um, and instead, I felt bravery. There was an appetite for change that normally doesn't exist in companies, and I ran with it. And, um, and my greatest fear is that it's going to stop, that people aren't going to want to keep changing. Um, but we, we, we literally are just, we're like, we're change hungry. And we just, I don't want to say we're power hungry, we're change hungry. And, and every change we make fuels the next one. Um, how cool is that, right? Change hungry, that's my new favorite hashtag. I love that. Um, you're a small, you two have smaller agencies. Um, 25,000 around the world, John? No, 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 no. <laughs> 14,653. Oh, that's all. <laughs> Decades, people, we're all counting. I know. Um, so it's, it's a little easier to be change hungry and immediate and responsive when it's a smaller agency. It's a little harder when there's 14,000 people around the globe. So how do you be change hungry in that environment? Because you have been, I've seen it and heard it. Yeah, I, I, don't, th I don't think of the company as 15,000 people. Um, you know, I, I've been on a road show for the last six weeks. I go to Sao Paulo and I have 250 people, or I go to India and I have 350 people. So, you know, I, I look at things in sort of anywhere from 75 to 400, not 15,000. And I think that's where you have to, you have to be confident that in groups of 75 to 400, everybody gets it and, and are doing the right things. And, and that's why you have to have, you have to have programs, you have to have training, you have to have metrics, you have to have leadership accountability, and you have to have, you have, to have ambition. Because, you know, to the point here is that crisis, in my experience working with clients over the years, nothing solves a crisis better than ambition to say, you know what, we can see in a root cause analysis all the little things that in and of themselves were probably harmless, but when they collectively came together, they created a disaster. And I think that's what you're describing in, you know, in, in behaviors. And so I think what, you know, what we're just trying to do is we're trying to tackle this you know, one person at a time, 10 people at a time, 100 people at a time, not 15,000 at a time. 15,000 need to know what we believe in and, and, and what we say, and they have to experience the doing behind that. But it's, it's built block by block. I love that. That's community, right? Yeah. That's how we build it. Um, so one of the things that you guys have each experienced is success and failure. And I'd love to hear what you got 
we hear a little bit about what you're getting right, which is amazing. We can even get to specific hows and get down, drill down, and I'd love to, actionable. But what did you, like, let's, what's the failure story? What did you not do right? What would you do differently next time? Eric, do you want to start and sort of share your thoughts on that? Well, you make mistakes all the time, and the, the day you, you, you don't accept it, I think you're, you're not going to accept the fact that you're human. Uh, I think I was, uh, I mean, I came here and this happened fairly quick after I came and I think I was a little bit naive around how things work in this country just from a PR perspective and uh, also when it comes to the mindset of people. Um, I mean, if I look at it in the mirror right now, I mean, we've implemented a lot of change. I, I mean, there is not a lot of people left at the agency when it comes to the previous leadership. Uh, and I, uh, I, I would say that a part of my, my maybe being naive was that I thought I could save more initially than I actually was able to do. Um, um, I think th when it comes to the actual situation I was in, I think that was my, my biggest mistake maybe and I lost some momentum initially as a consequence of that. Um, uh, so probably my biggest, but it's, I don't know. It, I, I could probably list yeah, a ton human of mistakes. Was the I would, <laughs> that's a big mistake in this industry in general. I'm sorry, you guys. <laughs> but, but I think being a bit naive and not really fully understanding things, um, I, I, maybe it's also a consequence of the way I decided to onboard myself when I started at the agency because I did it the complete opposite way of what is expected. Because I started at the bottom of the agency because I was so aware of the fact that this is an agency in a dramatic need of change. And for me to change it, I need the conversation. And then I have to lower the barrier around me because I know that every day when I walk into the office, I have a sign on my forehead where it says global CEO and people are going to be afraid of me. So I, I, I decided to lower the barrier around me because I can't expect anyone else to do it. So I met all the junior creatives, was the first group I met at the agency. I met all the junior production people. I met all the project managers and I didn't care shit about the leadership. I moved my way up through the organization. And maybe, maybe I think that was a, you, a very smart thing to do because I think uh, it made me very approachable when we came to the actual process of handling this. But maybe it also was a mistake because I didn't really know leadership enough when it happened and it went down and maybe that made me a little, me a little bit naive. But um, I don't regret it, but, um, but I, it's... Learning. It's learning, but I, um, but I think when in general, in order to, to handle a situation like this takes a lot of transparency and it needs you have to be brave and you have to realize the fact that the people who work at your agency is your biggest asset to handle it. And, you, and, and I think uh, as a leader, you really have to go, you have to invest in the relationship with the people you work with. You can't expect them to work for you, but you can work with them, which is very different. And I, I think that is just a very important perspective of leadership in general. We're so overmanaged as an industry. We, we believe in the idea of control of people and, and processes and organizations, but I, I think it's more about leadership, which is very different because you're not in charge. You're only responsible. And as a consequence of responsibility, you need some power and rights. Uh, and I think that is the in important perspective when you handle this. And, and when you think about leadership in general, and when you think about change in this, in, in this industry, the need of change, I think it is just totally changed the perspective of what leadership means. Uh, and see it as, uh, I tell everyone that is a leader within the organization that you're not given any rights, you're just given a hell of a lot of responsibility. <laughs> Are you sure you want it? Yeah. You will get some power as a consequence, but a consequence of the responsibility, but only as that. And um, that's good. It's not your. It's like the responsibility. I love that. And uh, Kristen, you talked a lot about things that you learned that you might have done differently, and new leadership, and what you're bringing in a new way. You want to tell a little bit? Sure. Um, I probably did, I did a thousand things wrong. Um, none of it was worse than what created the thing that got me into the job, though. So I think it's all perspective. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anything I did was going to be better <laughs> if we were digging out of a hole. Um, uh, I went in with vision 
And I'll tell you, I think in times of crisis, people don't follow vision, they follow availability. Uh, vision was like way up here, and people were dealing with pain and anger. And pain and anger are pragmatic little bastards, and they, um, they need to be fought with humanity, uh, much like Eric just said. So um, I, I, I developed a Slack channel. Every time I leave the agency, I, I post pictures of where I am because there was this sense that if I was at a client meeting and, and I wasn't there, because I had to go make sure we didn't lose any clients, so I was on the road a little bit. At the beginning, there was a sense of well, where did she go? Like, we're needy too. And so I would take ridiculous photos of myself on the road at client meetings. Um, one of the female creative directors of our company started this thing called hashtag mom songs. Whenever she's in the car, she sings these really bad karaoke songs to the car radio. And Karen and I one time were stranded coming back from LaGuardia at 2 a.m. and we sang Total Eclipse of the Heart and we posted it for the whole agency. <laughs> and it was really good, I have to say. Like, I think Is that on it fish earned ball? us a lot. Um, we have an ice cream truck that comes every Thursday and we would buy the ice cream for the agency. Um, we, uh, I send an email every Sunday with just something that's pricked me or that I've seen or that I've read. It could be anything. It could be the new Mission Impossible. It could be something I've seen in politics. It could be 52 ways that I think we need to act against hate. And, um, and all of it was just being present, just be present. And it took me um, a little while to not speak about vision because I thought that's the answer, right? The other thing that I, um, t it took me too long to learn was um, to tackle culture like a business problem and not a societal problem. Sometimes when things are big and societal, they seem too big to solve. Like right now, I don't even begin to know how to solve the political issues or the racial inequality in this country or a hundred things that are wrong. But then I stopped and thought, our clients give us big problems every day and the first thing we do is sit down and write a brief. So I wrote a brief for our talent and culture unit and I was like, this is what we want to do. And then we wrote a second brief, and then we wrote a third brief, and then we just thought, well, let's just use the tools that we use every single day to solve problems. And when we did that, they became um, feasible. They became doable. And all of a sudden, we looked up and we'd done a whole lot of stuff, and we felt good about the stuff we'd done. So. I just think don't forget that every day you're in a problem solving business and you've got amazing tools right at your disposal and they can be used to solve some of the biggest problems that you're dealing with um, right there. I love it. So we're hearing radical collaboration. We're hearing transparency. We're hearing, you know, authentic availability, if you will. So we're also, John, you've, as you said, um, is it eight leaders that you are? The seventh leaders that you are? Eight before me. Eight before you. So. Um, You've seen leadership really change in, in your lifetime. It's been a huge, radical <laughs> change of leadership. We've heard some of 21st century leadership skills. What are the ones that you want and embo to embody and you're seeing as a must-have now? Well, I, I brought um, five young women uh, together to sort of get to the central issue of what would move the, the whole company forward faster. Um, my chief marketing officer, Lauren Cramsey, who uh, is about to give birth to her second child at any moment. So I feel terrible. I don't have my phone at the ready, but a shout out for Lauren. But, but brought these five um, young women together. They're all from two to three years in, in the business. And, um, and, and they were trying to come up with a word, an idea, that they thought could galvanize everybody towards the sort of, you know, if we're in the midst of this transformation, driving it forward. And the word that they came up with, they first an analyzed what they thought was holding the company back. And a lot of it had to do with apathy or a lack of engagement or, you know, all the things that we were loath to hear about our companies. And the one word they had that they then spent an hour talking about how to activate it is curiosity. And, and curiosity, you know, the reason it was instantly right in my, in my opinion was it was the core to what made David Ogilvy David Ogilvy. Mm -hmm. The most curious man in the world, started the agency when he was 40. He'd had eight jobs before that, all driven by curiosity, things he wanted to learn or do. And, and I think the mistake I know I make every single day that I do think undermines leadership broadly is when people do not believe you are curious about them. Mm -hmm. When you're not curious about their work, their personal lives, 
the things that they're passionate about, the things that they know that they could do more of, the things that bring fear to them, the things that stop them from saying something about you know, what they think could be better. Um, and so I had this, you know, this kind of riff of how curiosity can almost cure everything. Mm. <laughs> and I just felt like it was so true. Um, I'll just tell one quick story. I, I, when we first won Ikea in the US, the client made us come down as a, as a get to know each other session and I had to bring the, the eight of the team members down. And their brief to, to us was, you have to bring a storyboard about your life. And so I saw seven of my partners present their life storyboards. And I literally wanted to crawl out of the room because I knew maybe you know 0.00% of what was on those storyboards, from musicians to you know foster parents to some of the stories we heard earlier. And it just was a, such a wake up call for me that if we are not curious about our people, bad things happen. Mm. Storyboards, there's an action for you. Yeah. I love that. So um, we can do all the right things we want. We can try and model all the brilliant things we want to be, and, and, and we're a service business. We have clients. And we've talked, when we spoke on the phone with each of you, we were talking about kind of this push me, pull me, the move to project base and everything else. And then at the same time, all the RFPs we're all getting right now saying, oh, what's your diversity base? And you know, how does it look, et cetera, et cetera. And the kind of, you must invest, or but you can't invest because we're only putting it on project base kind of thing. Talk to me about the relationship you guys have with your clients around trying to create the culture that you want to have and how does that match with everything you're trying to accomplish? Because you know, we at 3% talk about it. it used to be all about the creative and now it's really all a lot about the culture. So how do we do that in a service-based business? Um, Eric, you wanna start? I think it goes for the whole industry in general that we're under a ton of pressure from our clients to change. Uh, I, I kind of feel that we're all a part of a very uh, conservative industry that is still based upon an idea and a business model that was invented in the 50s and we have to reinvent it and i uh, and we we have to change the way we work we have to be way much more flexible way much more nimble and just uh, do things in a different way and i i think the pressure from the clients is actually helping us to change the culture and 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 do it in a different way we have to be internally much more entrepreneurial driven. We have to start empowering people and trusting people internally and see leadership as a support instead of being in charge of everything. We, we just have to do things very, very differently. And I think clients, the pressure we have from clients is a huge asset to drive the change that we have to change. It's all aligned. Um, we just have to accept it and figure out a way to support it in our in our own behavior and and within our own change process. So, uh, I like the pressure from the clients, and, and I like the idea that more and more is moving over to project based because it raises a lot of questions around our own productivity and efficient. How do we create an efficient and focused organization? So I I support it. I salute it because I think it needs to change. And what. John, you had a different point of view. You had some thoughts about the client pressures. Yeah, I think I think clients are a bit of a paradox on this. Um, I think we, I think many of us in the industry, the pressure starts uh, often with clients because they believe that there's something that they have to do differently, live up to, uh, think think differently about. Uh, but what gives me so much optimism about our industry is I don't think clients are anywhere near as mm -hmm. ambitious or progressive or moving as fast as they are passing the pressure for, for it all. They themselves are not moving as no. fast. No. Yeah. No. And and you know, so I think that if if I had one hope, you know, I all of us we go to you know things like the ANA conference and, and, and a lot of these organizations, and we hear the sort of wonderful case studies. But I actually think they should blow up that entire model. Because you know, th at the end of the day, I am tired in a way of being lectured to about what we're not doing to change or how we're not doing you know, this differently and all the rest of it. And I think we all collectively are part of a system that none of this is gonna change foundationally and in a sustained way unless we start working together as a system. And I think we need less about, you know, you, you need to do this uh, first uh, and more about how are we gonna do this together? Because, you know, in the everyday transacting with clients, 
you know, I don't find them quite as idealistic, quite as principled about what needs to change and what we do as the rhetoric. Um, and I don't fault them for it because, you know, the pressure on them as businesses, uh, the complexity of their operations make us look, you know, uh, fairly straightforward. But at the same time, I just think there is, and I, one of the things, you know, you and I talked about is, I just think we have to get a little bit out of the, you know, prognosticating from the sidelines about everybody else and start having a, you know, a deeper conversation about what we need to do together. And are you able to do, are you doing that I right think now? There are, I client? think there are some very progressive clients who are doing it, you know, incredibly well, mm -hmm. who, who are not afraid to ask for help, who, who are not, you know, shy about bringing, coming together, taking time out like events like this and, and really having a meaningful uh, dialogue about it. But I find too often it's very transactional. You know, here's an RFP that says this is the mix of resources we need to see, but then, you know, it's, it's a line in an RFP. You don't, you don't really talk about it in the context of how you're actually going to deliver on it. So I just, I just would hope that there's, a more, there's more ambition and there's more constructive dialogue between clients and our industry about, about all these issues. So we have lots of amazing client sponsors here. We can maybe talk to them. <laughs> um, they may not be, hit me back. <laughs> hit me back. <laughs> um, Kristen, when you and I were speaking, you um, said some really amazing things about how very forward-thinking you were. Well, and I got awful that it, that I'm saying it's forward-thinking, but forward-thinking about being very conscious around hiring for diversity, hiring with very intentional ways of making sure your team is diverse, and you've had amazing results. I can't tell you how many phone calls saying, "Oh, I want a diverse team, but I can't. There, I can't find them. The pipeline, blah blah blah, all that bullshit." What have you been able to do? How have you done it differently? And sort of teach us of mm. how we can learn from you. Um, well, I was in the pipeline. Karen was in the pipeline. Um, there Waiting are qualified. for a long time and ready for a long time. And maybe, you know, maybe we weren't raising our hands. I, I mean, maybe we were. I don't remember. But um, I think there are very qualified people in the pipeline. Um, and, and I have no doubt about it. Um, I am learning as I'm going. So everything I'm about to say, I learned probably from sitting on a panel um, much like this, and I'm sure I'm going to take things away from, and from here and, and employ them. Um, but I was on a panel um, at Cannes, and somebody said when there are four people interviewing for a job and three of them um, are one gender or one race and, and one is the, the odd, uh, the one other, as Haida said earlier. not like the other Sesame Street, remember that? Yeah. Do you guys remember that? No. It should yeah. be, I'm a stats major, so it should be if there are four people interviewing for a job, each person has a 25% probability of getting a job. But the truth is, if there are three that are alike and one that is different, the mathematical probability of the one getting a job is zero. Unless you're a man and the three are women and one is a man, then you have a 33% chance. And I heard this and I thought that can't be true. So I went home and I researched and I looked it up and it is true. And so um, I went and sat with our uh, talent and culture group and said, we have, to, we have to recruit differently. It's not enough to say we want to have a woman in the mix or an African-American in the mix or an Asian person in the mix or a Hispanic person in the mix because that's a token and we're not here to do token gestures. And so we got really intentional and um, we really invested heavily in making sure that we were changing things. And so one year in, not even one year, 10 months in, uh, over one third of the people we've hired have been diversity candidates this year, over 34%. And, um, and I think it has been, it has been a, you know, a very intentional thing. And shout out to my uh, talent culture people who are here. Um, we've, we've gone looking, we've gone hunting, we've gone out of our way, we've waited, we've held jobs open, um, we've just set the bar high. Um, and, uh, and we've just decided that uh, it's a, it's a non-negotiable. So in our industry, we talk about hiring for expediency, right? We often do that. We've got a new client, we've got to get the staff in, et cetera. How are you choosing not to hire for expediency when you've got client demands? Like, yes. how do you manage the client? Back to that question. How do you manage the, the client in that dynamic? I, in fact, I just, right before getting up here, um, had an uh, email from a consultant for a pitch we haven't even won yet, and we had put in a TBD for the lead account person, and they asked, well, who's it going to be? 
And I thought, I, I, I'm supposed to have hired the person when I don't even have the revenue yet. <laughs> um, but I said, I have a list of people and I'm actively interviewing and, and here's the list and, and you know, I'm on it. Um, I think it is a real pressure all the time. I, I, uh, I, we are constantly interviewing. I mean, that is, that is what it is. It is not, we don't wait for a job. We are constantly interviewing and always talking to people. Um, and uh, there are a number of people who have crossed the stage today that have already, so thank you for that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Richmond's a lovely place to live, <laughs> if you haven't been there. <laughs> so, you know, we talked, um, I loved, first of all, who didn't love Wade Davis this morning, right? Wasn't he great? None of us is as yes. smart as Wade Davis. We should all be Wade Davis when we grow up. But one of the things he said is that women ask the why. And I think um, women ask the why because the why matters. It's about purpose. Um, it's not just the what and the how. It's the why. And um, so why are you why are you who you are in this business and in this industry and how are you getting the courage to make the choices you're making? Give us some, a little bit more of the why. And John, I'm gonna put you on the spot because I know you've got a really beautiful family story. And it is about his mother and that's a good thing, wait, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, the, the story I was, I was telling some others is that um, my parents were divorced when I was 12 years old. I was living in the rural Wisconsin. Uh, when they told me that they were breaking up, I mean, I just, I had this idyllic life. I thought the world was, was over. And my mother um, felt abandoned, moved my brother and me to, to California. She, I think, literally got the map out and said, what's the farthest place <laughs> from Jefferson, Wisconsin I can find? It ended up being conveniently uh, San Diego, California, um, which was not a bad thing, but uh, addicted to uh, prescription drugs for uh, several years, had to go back. Um, uh, to school to get her real estate degree. Those were the days, this is the late, se uh, late 60s, uh, divorced women or most women, period, could not get credit. So we literally would pay cash for you know, every transaction. Um, and, and so I saw my mother go from you know, being the person who from the previous speaker was, you know, felt like she was holding me tight every day to having to be out of the house, you know, for most of the day, and, and my brother and me having to kind of, you know, figure it out for ourselves, which was not, you know, this was not, this was San Diego, this was not the South Bronx, you know, taking a bus for two and a half hours to get to school, but but the reality was I saw in my mother the sort of determination, and resiliency, uh, to pick herself up and 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 ultimately do extremely well, and I is serendipity would happen, you know, my Ogilvy career was really defined by women. I worked for the first woman managing director of the Los Angeles office of Ogilvy, a woman named Bourne Morris. My first overseas assignment, I worked for a woman named Sananda Taliadin, the first country manager, woman country manager of an Ogilvy market. Uh, and then I had the extraordinary experience of, of working for Charlotte Beers and Shelley Lazarus for, you know, uh, most of my career. So. So it, it's as luck would have it, I had these amazing women uh, role models. And, and it, the one thing that's amazing when you don't think you're ever good enough because you know, as a college dropout, I never thought I, I was really prepared for Ogilvy. I had amazing mentors and, and, and women role models, frankly, that, that gave me the confidence to try and lead the firm in the way that, that I think is, is the right way. There's some truth for you people. Love that, love that, thank you. How about you, my, my Swedish friend? <laughs> well, I also had the, the privilege of having a lot of female leaders in the beginning of my career, that, um, which I actually think is more common in Sweden than it is here. Um, but to me, it's all about my, my core beliefs and what I believe in. Uh, I believe in the idea of diversity of thought and in, in diversity in general. And I have a daughter. I think that explains a lot to me, and I, I, I'm. I also believe that when you're a leader of a company, you you, you have a lot of responsibility, and you have a responsibility uh, the, to the people that that are that work with you at your company. You have a responsibility to the brand, the owners, of course, and the legacy of the brand and the future of the brand. But you also have a uh, some type of 
responsibility towards society in general. And you have to think about how you behave because you affect society. And, and us working in communication, we really do. I hope we do. Otherwise, everything we do is just completely pointless. But, and I think you have to accept that responsibility and, and think about how you behave and what you believe in. And you have to find that within yourself. And I, I know what I believe in. And um, I can commit to this. I'm, I'm only going to do whatever I do as long as I can do what I believe in because I, I'm just way too old to do something <laughs> else. So. I, I mean, I would love to leave the agency in a better place than where I found it. I would love to travel more. I'd love to do a whole lot of things. Like, I'm, I'm young and single, and I have people to meet and places to go and things to do. So I, I, don't, I don't intend to uh, We don't stop. need Bumble. We've got 3%. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say this. I think that um, we, like, to your point, we've done a lot of things. But um, we did a lot of things because we had the permission of crisis. And it, it, it created um, an opportunity where we were allowed to act with impatience. And um, I wish upon you that you have that same crisis because I actually don't think people will do much without it. I mean, we've known forever the right thing to do and we don't do it. Um, so, I mean, it sounds horrible to say, but um, we are a better company today because of everything that we lived through and, um, and faced and um, and did and um, and I'm grateful. It was the most painful gift that could have been given to our company. I hope we all have leaders like this. When we face a crisis, and we let's hope we don't have a situation where we have a culture that creates that crisis. Let's start there. But if in fact we do, let's have leaders that actually own it, are transparent about it, are collaborative about the solution, are action driven, um, and maybe our industry will just be a little bit better next time around. Um, thank you all. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you.